Welcome to the Leadership Experience Podcast, where we seek to build connections, talk relevant issues about warfighting and share professional knowledge through experience and lessons learned with guests from a variety of different professional backgrounds. It's our way to relate to multiple generations within our formation and create real conversations as we build a team of teams committed to winning and dedicated to the pursuit of excellence. We hope you enjoy our content. You can continue to find the Lancer Brigade on Facebook and Instagram and find our podcast content on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as you search for the Lancer Brigade or the Leadership Experience. Enjoy. Hey team, check it out. Today we welcome Coach Mike Barwis. Coach Barwis is the founder and CEO of the Barwis family of companies, but is commonly recognized as one of the most influential strength coaches of all time. He has spent his entire career focusing on human performance and sports science with organizations including the New York Mets, Detroit Red Wings, and Miami Dolphins. His contributions today will continue our exploration into athletes with guns as we talk about the importance of resiliency and grit in conjunction with assessing, testing, and optimizing our daily performance as soldiers. Hey, Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to have a conversation with us today. My honor. Really, I'm always honored. And anything I can do for you guys, I'm in. You guys do a heck of a lot more than, than we could ever do. Well, I, I wanted to start, if, uh, if you could, just with things are going on with COVID. I know you got the Mike Barwis method going on, and we'll get into that a little bit. But with COVID and the recent conditions, how are you having to adjust anything in your lifestyle right now when it comes to your athletes that you're, that you're working on and, and toward any of the goals that they got going on? You know, for us, it's been interesting. So we, we, we do a lot of different things, right? You know, we have uh, uh, from disabled people to, uh, you know, some general population to the world's top athletes to, you know, physical therapy, chiropractor, uh, massage therapy, uh, rejuvenation medicine with, you know, stem cell and PRPs. And we do all that within our facility. So we're uh, down to biometrics and recovery labs and, Everything you can fathom, we, we run. We also run nine pro teams in five different leagues. Uh, we're the only private organization that runs professional sports. And so we really had a lot of exposure in a lot of areas. Um, for us, it was interesting because the pros don't stop working. I mean, that's, that's their career. It's kind of like the U.S. military. We're not all going home. So it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a matter of they, they've got to keep training. They've got to keep working and, and doing what they need to do to be successful. So. Uh, having those guys and controlling the variables, making sure that we're maintaining a clean environment, that we're, uh, you know, sterilizing between exercises and separating the athletes, and segmenting the times and making sure we're cleaning between those sessions was really pinnacle to us being able to afford a safe environment for our guys and our girls. Uh, and then having disabled people who they, they can't stop training either. People are injured or unhealthy or, or need rehabilitation. Uh, if they stop training, they, they lose function. So for us, uh, we had to really kind of break down the gym uh, and, and the medical side into different segments and have people at different times uh, in smaller quantities uh, and also accommodate uh, a rotation that allowed for us to completely fumigate an area and then they move to another section before someone came in. Uh, so the nice thing we have, we got about 65,000 square feet down here in Florida. So that, that aids us in, in getting the people we need in there and, and, uh, and being able to handle the volume. I have some coaches that are a heck of a lot more talented than I am, uh, which is nice. I'm always the worst one I got, which is a good thing. So, uh, uh, those people have done a great job at really making sure we're constructive, we're, we're thorough with our evaluations. Uh, we're very complete with the with the sterilization, and that we're uh, we're managing the situation. You know, all of our people wore masks for a long period of time. Uh, many at this point now, the governor's kind of removed that, so they don't have to wear masks to train. Or uh, it was interesting even to see our guys with the intensity that we train. It, it's it's rigorous. Uh, with a mask on your face, it makes it even a little bit more rigorous. So, so it was. Uh, I think we got more out of conditioning this year than in the past because uh, guys couldn't get any oxygen because they were getting suffocated while training. So, uh, but no, it, it 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 was interesting. It was very constraining at some points. Uh, did take a lot of organizational skills, uh, a lot of uh, um, 
uh, segregation uh, of the population to make sure that we were we were working in different areas at different times. Um, a, a, a significantly more uh, cleaning apparatus, uh, spray guns to fumigate in between to get the turf and other areas, and uh, and then dealing with the CDC for all the leagues. You know, for the leagues, uh, we we're getting into Major League Baseball. I run, I oversee the New York Mets as well, and uh, that got cut off in spring training. So we had to, you know, try and figure out places to help those guys stay ready to play. So when they went back in, uh, they were ready to go and then structure our strength and conditioning staff so that we have the same rotations so that guys are in different areas. We're not overlapping, uh, eliminate some of our staff from being around the players, but they could still do their jobs remotely to help the players. Uh, and then the same thing with the NHL. Uh, you know, I run the Detroit Red Wings as well. So I had to do the same thing there and are still dealing with some of those repercussions. That's that's great. Great on you, Coach, with you and your team. I mean, really what it sounds like, so similarly here just in our own brigade in the military, as you mentioned, you know, we don't shut down. So initially we, we established this safe and secure environment. We looked at who was mission essential. And then as we established procedures to take into consideration, hey, how do we evac somebody if they do end up having the symptoms? You know, how do we triage them across our, our remainder of our force? So for us, you know, we looked at those high population areas. We've got barracks, you know, with a lot of 18 to 25-year-olds that are all living in there. You know, if one of those individuals end up becoming positive for COVID, how do we make sure that we can get those individuals, isolate them, put them in another facility, activate, you know, preventative med, med teams that can do the contact tracing and then clean. And at the same time, then there's on the other hand that, Hey, you know, we can't be standing around. I think people thought that, hey, for about two, three weeks, hey, this was going to be something. And then, okay, then the kids started coming home from school and no one was going back. And it was like, we we got to figure it out. And I, I think my boss kind of laid it out the best. He said, listen, our standards haven't changed. Just the conditions have adjusted. So we need to look at how we're going to mitigate and get after some of those things. And, you know, I, I appreciate what you were mentioning there that I think a lot of leaders, coaches, mentors have had to figure out how to still make this connection, which is part of the reason why we were, you know, we went to doing, doing podcasts. How do you make this connection still be able to do leader development, hear from great, you know, individuals and professionals like yourself dealing with these same type of challenges and still trying to make it, you know, a connection. I'd, uh, I'd listen to, uh, Dr. Colleen Hacker, and she was talking about this four plus one, you know, techniques, tactics, physiological, psychological, and team. And one of the things that she had mentioned was, you know, for, for the time of COVID, how do you get somebody to, you know, do things and then be accountable and measurable? So it's not just, hey, did you work out today? It's you came back, what technique, for how long, did they put it in a log or a journal? So if there's something that did you do with your, with your coaches and team that you think that we could apply here, I'd, I'd appreciate it. So I know the team would if you've got some suggestions. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, as things started to roll, we're to the point now where, you know, we're able to start reintegration and, and get people uh, uh, working in, in more of the natural conducive environments to their success. Uh, when it initially happened, we have a thing called BMI. Uh, I run an AMS system, which is an athlete management software on all of our athletes. Uh, I can remote access any data. I can track all their biometrics. I can look at, uh, you know, in a day, we will check their hydration. We'll check their sleep ratios. Uh, we will check their, uh, their biometrics, maybe from an omega wave, depending upon what device, you know, DP, DC potential, sympathetic, parasympathetic responses, heart rate variability, all of those factors. And then we run an acute on chronic workload progression with them as well to determine what is the workload and do they deviate by, from that workload by more than 20% at any given time within a 28 day period. If they do, then we're at risk. So we've got to modulate all of those factors. I can run those from almost anywhere. So we were able to continuously run all of those different gamuts on our athletes uh, from remote sectors. Uh, and at the same time, we were able to build out remote programming via video and, uh, and phone, even, even uh, assess and analyze guys uh, via uh, Zoom and, and build out corrective exercises for things that they had that were imbalanced. 
and then put progressions into the telephone right on their phone. They could click, they pull up their workout. I had a video of the exercise, how to do it. And then they'd have to enter the data and track that data, which was then formulated back to us. And we could evaluate and adjust the periodization protocols and then also adjust their recovery balance based on the biometrics that we were receiving uh, in an offsite location. So that's what we've done. We have to do that usually for guys that don't necessarily come with us. Maybe a guy lives in Wisconsin and he can't access one of our facilities in the off season, but he trains with one of our pro teams. So we'll still run many of those metrics on that athlete all the way in Wisconsin or wherever he might be uh, to allow us to track. Instead of having just a few guys, we did it with all guys. And we were able to implement that, that, that uh, a large volume of information into our uh, data tracking AMS systems and, and formulate adaptive programming for our guys in remote sites. I mean, initially when they locked everybody down, I had guys stealing their kids' backpacks and filling them with rocks and putting them on their back for weights because they, they didn't have equipment. So I said, look, your son can't go to school right now anyway. Fill the thing with a bunch of rocks, put it on your back, we're going to work. So that was kind of some of the stuff I had guys holding uh, seven pounds. You know, we got a, a gallon of water, it's about seven pounds, so they're holding them out, they're using gallons of water, whatever we could so that they didn't lose uh, functional components of, of what they need to be successful. And, and uh at this, you know, at this point now, we've got a lot more implementation and, and people coming back in. So we, we uh, like, for instance, with, with professional sports, a lot of times we're limiting to six people going into the gym at a time. Uh, we bring in 12 at a time, six go onto the playing field, six go into the gym. Uh, we put up six stations for rotation with a, uh, a process for uh, uh, cleaning the area directly before the next rotation has uh, happens. And we put a time of about two minutes between that shift to allow for the cleaning uh, to actually take place and kill any viruses that might be uh, uh, still there. Um, allowing for us to do the training at a full, uh, full level, just in smaller groups. Uh, and then when they leave, we completely fumigate the room. They shift to the ice at the hockey or the field, the other group shifts in and, and we've limited uh, people that aren't absolutely essential to the hands-on contact with the athletes, uh, allowing us to uh, control the environment as best possible uh, to maintain a, a cleanly environment and reduce the risk of viral transfer. So uh, by doing so in that environment, we're able to kind of get the whole team through. It just takes a lot more hours. Uh, and and the, the, the other challenge is, is providing an environment that's conducive mentally su to success, right? I mean, I think sometimes people look at this and they say, hey, you know, it's restricted my ability to get where I'm, I'm trying to go from a developmental process. I disagree. I think that you control that. You know, you control two tangible things in life. You control your attitude and your effort. Everything else was, you know, God laid something on you. He gave you abilities. He gave you talents. But everything you developed was because you had a strong attitude and a tremendous amount of effort. Those are the two variables we always control. And if we control those variables to the maximum of our ability, we'll succeed. And any environment we're placed in, it's still controlling them, whether it's, a, whether it's an environment that restricts some of the variables that allow us to accommodate optimal success, that's fine. Then we change our attitude and we get focused on accomplishing the task with the variables that we do have that we can control. And we change our, our effort and we put in a tremendous effort with a rigorous amount of effort to accomplish the task at hand, we're going to succeed. And, and I think part of that is setting a mindset, you know, Mindset is a perception. What we perceive is what reality really is. And if we walk into the room as this is going to be hard, it's going to be tough, it's different, guess what? It's hard, tough, and it's different. If we walk into the room that, look, this is what I have, and I'm going to accomplish my task, and I'm going to bring everything I have every second that I'm standing here because the little things make up the big things. Therefore, I will not switch on the little things. To, uh, to accommodate the results that I want to achieve. And that, that, that fashion, that mindset, and that mentality has to be conveyed from leadership. It has to be conveyed from the people who are running uh, the training sessions or managing the teams or the coaches. And it has to be uh, conveyed from the captains, uh, the, the leaders of the environment. If it is, we start to forget that we're in a different environment because, uh, you know, I, people always say we rise to the occasion. I think that's crap. I think the reality is we resort back to the level of our training. 
the, U, the military has shown that better than anyone in, in world history. That's right. And if, if, if you're under duress and you deal with stress and you face hardship and you understand how to overcome it and, and deal with it in a positive manner and always move forward, you burn the bridge behind you so there's no place for retreat and you're always moving forward. If that is your mentality, you will always succeed. It may be hard. It may have struggles. It may be detrimental sometimes to your situation. However, in the long term, the outcome will always be what you want. I think that's great, not just advice for an athlete or for anybody that's in the military. That will, this will absolutely resonate with them, but I think it's just great advice in life of any type of challenge. I mean, what you're talking about in this mindset is – anything that you're dealing with. I mean, it could be your, you know, some traumatic, you know, situation that you're going through with COVID, you know, whether it's something with challenges, but if you look for the things and change the mindset that you, you know, and there's a great, you know, saying when you're talking about resiliency and building grit, that if you can fall, you know, seven times at rise eight, and you know that you're going to encounter something that's going to be difficult. I love, I, I tell my son all the time, right, that uh, you truly will see an individual's potential. I said that uh, when you see work ethic, passion, and talent aligned. And I think that when you, you know, I also tell them that the only reason that you, you fail something is because, number one, you didn't prepare and study with the, the right material, or you didn't prepare or study under conditions that were going to be harder than what you were going to be tested. And so what you mentioned that, you know, that aspect about what, like, that's what we're preparing for. We're preparing for combat. And so, you know, one of the things that's awesome about being in this, institution in the profession of arms is we have this awesome responsibility for repetitive professional judgment and that's to manage two things violence and risk so this leadership aspect what i offer to my team is hey we're we're in the business about developing leaders to make better decisions in combat under duress so how do you do that stuff right in time sensitive situations and i think what you mentioned there absolutely about mindset right is the beginning when everybody loves predictability Everybody loves this, you know, once they get to that moment of comfort, nobody likes things that are changing, that are different, you know, and it's, uh, you know, better than I do, right? If you don't stress, you know, the muscle, it won't grow. So I was wondering, you know, as you talk through these and, and you can, you can tell that this is something you live, you know, as your, as your mantra. And I've seen a couple of your, your videos that you've spoken about, and, and I'd love to at the very end, talk about the Mueller, you know, uh, brothers, because we're trying to get both those guys to come up to actually visit. And uh, this would be a. We can get that done. I might come with them. Yeah, that would that would be awesome. That'd be a great you know second part to this, and it'd just be a great inspirational story about you know overcoming all these different you know challenges and going through. But I was wondering if we could kind of step into the time machine, coach, and and tell guys, okay, you know they know that you're a you know a head strength coach, uh, strength and conditioning, in West Virginia, Michigan, hundreds of Olympic and professional athletes, and now all the things you're talking about with the teams. But where did this all start? So going back in the beginning, you know, young Mike Barwis, did it start with, a, you know, as, as you were a young athlete or, you know, mom and dad? Who instilled this thing into you? And then, and then as you mentioned now, you know, what you're instilling in young athletes, especially it's really the mindset to go overcome some of these challenges. You know, uh, it's great questions. You know, my, my family uh, grew up and I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Uh, my grandfather and uh, grandmother were dairy farmers, uh, blue collar, tough people. My dad was a construction worker. Uh, you know, everything they did was about work, grind, be tough, you know, have a strong mentality, never surrender. Uh, that was kind of the bloodline of my family when I was young. And, and if you didn't fit in it, you, you had a problem. So, 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 uh, you know, from, from a perspective of growing up and looking at my mindset, it was developed from a young age. It's funny, to this day, as soon as my kids can talk, I teach them one thing right away. And it's funny, everybody, people, the, the players love to ask my, my little girl who's, you know, she's young. I didn't have any kids till I was 36. So I've got a 13-year-old, I've got a 11-year-old, uh, I've got a 10-year-old, and I've got an 8-year-old. So the youngest one, I'm going to be 110 when they're out of the house. So the youngest one is, is, uh, is little girl, cute as a button, right, gymnast. And when she walks into the room, all the players always like to ask her a question. Well, it's something I taught them when, when they were young. As soon as they could speak, I'd say, what is fear? And I'd make them answer, and they'd have to say a liar. 
And I'd say it again, what is fear? It's a liar. What is fear? It's a liar. Their whole lives, they've heard that. So when they walk in a room and someone asks them a question, what is fear? They all respond strongly, it's a liar. And the little eight-year-old looking up to a 365-pound, six-foot-six man when he says, what is fear, intensely, and she looks him back in the face and says, a liar, tough. And he looks back like, geez, that's That's a mentality that is taught. It's a mentality that is, that is instilled into your mindset. And it's a mentality you can teach yourself. Uh, the ability to talk to yourself that, that fear is an, is an inhibition that stands with in, uh, in between you and everything you want to achieve in life. Uh, you know, there's healthy fear, for sure. And there's fear that lies to you, that, de- that defines you or tries to define you based on what it limits in your ability to perform. And, and when we look at that from a mindset, that's something I was taught when I was young, that if you are afraid, you will achieve nothing. A life lived in fear is a life not lived. You have to have the ability to say, I am not afraid of anything that stands in front of me. I will give 110% of what I have because if I fail, it will only be a failure if I learn nothing and I do nothing to change it. In fact, a failure is a greater success than a victory if I learn something and do something to change it. Therefore, I no longer have a weakness that I had prior to that instance. That is something. Victory, oftentimes, we don't change anything. We did great. We performed well. But we might not eliminate a weakness that wasn't exposed. That's true. In a failure, we get a weakness exposed if we do something about it and we, we, we recognize it we observe it, we figure out what it was, and then we change it. We are stronger than we were than when we won. The reality of that is understanding that losing doesn't scare me. Being in a, being in a position where I learn nothing from my loss during my training scares me because now I'm in a place where I have to compete with a weakness. I don't want to compete with a weakness. I want to get rid of anything that's in me that is weakness before the competition. When I arise on that competition, I want to show up an invincible human being. And that's a mindset that walks in the room. I think I was taught that young, you know, growing up with my grandparents and my, and my father, uh, they all worked long hours. Uh, my grandparents helped raise me. Uh, my grandfather, one time we went outside and, and, uh, I was working on the farm for him digging post holes. We dug all day long. My brothers actually went back inside, which was kind of funny and and had lunch. I was trying to be the tough guy that day and I was going to show them I was going to work through lunch. I was going to fight my way through the whole day. I wasn't taking any breaks. Water was all I wanted. We finished the day and we were out there the whole day. My hands were bleeding from digging post holes for them. I walked in, I took all the tools, cleaned them up, put them on the shelf, hung them back up where they belonged. And My grandfather was kind of a a, a rigorous man. You didn't get many compliments. So uh, I walked back into the barn. I'm leaving the barn. I'm walking out and he's coming in. And I said, Pop, everything's done. Everything's cleaned up. I got it taken care of. I'm going to go inside. I'm going to get dinner. And he walked past me. He didn't say thank you. didn't say anything. And I heard him say, hey. And I turned around and he walked back over and grabbed my ear. And he drug me back into the barn. And I thought, oh, what the heck did I do? So he looked up and there was a shovel on the wall and he pointed to the shovel and he said, son, did the shovel have dirt on it when you got it out? And I said, no, sir. And he looked at me. He said, if the shovel may work better with dirt on it, they'd make it that way. <laughs> Take it back outside, scrub the shovel and hang it back up. So I walked back outside and I was thinking to myself, the old man is crazy. I'm out there scrubbing on the darn thing with a, with a wire brush to clean this st- stupid shovel. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This is the dumbest thing I ever did. Little did I know that that would help me more in my life than just about anything. Because by the time I hung the shovel up, I realized it wasn't the fact that I dug the post holes. It wasn't the fact that I hung up the tools. It was the fact that I had missed a detail that was unimportant to me that eliminated eliminated me from being completely successful in my task. That the tiny details are what make up the big accomplishments. And it's funny, if you look, I don't know if I can turn it, but there's a shovel hanging on that wall over there in the corner. (laughs) That shovel 
is in every office I have. And it reminds me, do the little things. Pay attention to the details. Do what I'm supposed to do to accomplish the large, ta large task. Adhere to the discipline that I desire to be the outcome in the end. And that, for me, is the same thing I want to inform athletes. That was taught to me by my grandfather. It was taught to me again by my father. Uh, a second instance, I was probably 12 or 13 years old, and I was looking for a way to kind of make some money. My friends were going in Philadelphia to the movies. I thought it was a cool idea. They got allowance, not in my house, no chance. You worked because you were supposed to. So uh, uh, the end of the day, kids were all going to the movie. I went up to my father and I said, Dad, can I, uh, I'd like to go to a movie tonight. He said, great. When you're done your chores, go ahead. And I said, well, is there a way I could get a few dollars to go? And he looked at me and he smiled and he started laughing. He said, yeah, if you earn them. And I said, okay, uh, how about an allowance? Like I'll, I'll do the chores around here and, and maybe I get an allowance. And he said, not in my house. So I looked at him again. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, uh, all my friends get an allowance. And he said, son, yours is not to ask questions. Yours is to bear the burden, to carry the load, and to make it happen. That's your job in life. You bear the burden, you carry the load, and you make it happen. Anything else in life is an excuse. I looked at him and nodded my head. I walked inside and I wrote it down in the front of my Bible. And I put it right there, bear the burden, carry the load, make it happen. And I carry with me forever. It's on my son's walls in the room. That's awesome. The Bible sits right there. Both of those things sit around me at all times because I want to remind myself that when I feel sorry for me, the truth is I'm shirking my responsibility and my obligation as a human being. That somewhere, somewhere else, at some other time, someone is suffering more than I am doing what I'm doing. Therefore, it is my obligation to impact the lives around me in a positive manner. If I have that same mentality throughout life, I succeed. And that taught me at a young age. I grew up and decided I really liked athletics. I was highly competitive, you know, competed in multiple sports growing up and, and, was, and was pretty successful. Uh, Decided when I went to college, I wanted to be involved in that avenue. Um, I originally went into medicine and thought, you know, I want to be in sports medicine. Uh, did very, very well uh, in that field. But it was a little bit too sedated for me. Uh, my energy and my passion was not well spent in a medical area. I had a 4.0. I blew through the academics. And uh, I hit a point where I'm like, if I do this for a living, I might go crazy. So I've got to take the science and the knowledge of science that I love, and I've got to spin it off into another field. At that time, there was not very much science and strength and conditioning and, and the world of human performance. Uh, and it was basically you lifted weights and you ended up being a strength coach or you were on the football team and you were the strength coach. And uh, I was in, you know, strength and conditioning, sports medicine, all the other areas. And I thought, you know what, I, I want to go into this field and I want to bring something to it it doesn't have. So I started to bring in science and functional movement training and biomechanics and biometrics and all types of testing a long, long time ago, over 20 some years. When, when I did it, everybody looked at me and said, this guy's crazy, it's not gonna work. And I started at West Virginia University uh, with a group of athletes. And, and at that time it was just football and basketball and they didn't really train other teams. And I openly uh, suggested that we train the other teams, I'll take them. So I ended up working with 20 some odd sports, uh, me and me and an intern and 600 and some odd athletes and show up at 430 in the morning and leave at nine o'clock at night, work seven days a week and no excuses. Let's let's give what we have inside us to a greater cause, which is the greater population. And uh, and, and, and we did that and had tremendous success in developing uh, protocols and programs with one and two star recruits that nobody wanted who uh, were deemed as unworthy of competing for national contention and ended up finishing fourth in the Sears Cup, one of the top universities in the country, uh, every team being nationally ranked uh, and, 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 and dominating college sports with kids that they didn't think could compete at that level. Uh, 
Uh, and, and the reality of that domination didn't come down to me. It came down to putting together the protocols and the programs and the science and athletes who were willing to do what no one else was willing to do. I tell people all the time, you can't, uh, you know, you can't accomplish great things and do mediocre things to achieve it. It, 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 it doesn't happen that way. You know, we always say you can't do common things and expect uncommon results. Mm. As a reality, we were willing to push harder and do things that were more rigorous and, and more time consuming than other institutions who had four and five star recruits. Therefore, we were able to outcompete them because we reached our potential. I tell people all the time, you know, you have potential, right? I say, where's your potential? It's here. Okay. So if I work to here, what is this? And they look at me and I'm like, it's nothing. Absolutely nothing. If my potential is here and I work to here, I am here. The problem uh, oftentimes with the population is we have potential that's here, but we're only willing to work to here. Mm. Therefore, the kid that has potential here and works to here beats us. And the reality is if we're willing to commit to all facets of life and discipline to accomplish our tasks and we work to a standard that adheres to our potential, we succeed in accomplishing what God put us on the earth to do. Anything short of that is a compromise. And as a reality, you never see what you are really capable of doing in life. And that's athletics, that's life, that's everything you do. And going to West Virginia and having those athletes and developing a program with 27 sports and, and hundreds of athletes and working with them every day and learning from them as they learn from me and developing science into a program that people deem you just lift weights, that's what you do, this is all garbage. First doing functional movement training and balance balls and other things with football players, they said you're crazy. They weren't saying we were crazy when we were ranked number one in the country with kids that they didn't recruit. And the reality of that was, are you willing to do what you need to do every step every second of the day are you willing to bear the burden are you willing to carry the load and are will you make it happen when you pick up the shovel will it be clean and a finely tuned machine to allow me to accomplish the task with the greatest fluence i possibly could and that to me is the key to putting things together and, and west virginia was a great developmental place for me coming from athletics being in science being exposed to medicine, intertwining that into uh, the field of athletics and starting to really be one of the people who integrated true scientific approach into training, but doing it with a discipline that the military has done better than anyone in world history uh, and integrating, integrating that into our programming uh, to accommodate the science to function at the greatest level. And then being in a motivational atmosphere, because I, I'm a firm believer we're built, we're, we're born with traits, talents, abilities, and passions. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when we, when we control our attitude and our effort, and we focus and allow our traits, our talents, and our abilities to come to their greatest fruition, and we fortify them in a direction where our God given passion drives us we become an unstoppable force because we've taken everything that was put inside us and we've controlled the two variables. The, the things inside us were gifts. Now we've controlled the two variables that allowed them to culminate in our attitude and our effort. And we're focused on something we want to do, our passion. When we attack it that way, we will always succeed. And that was something that I was able to be a part of at West Virginia. Again, I was the weakest link. I had some great people around me, some great coaches, and some tremendous athletes. And that allowed me to grow and really cultivate what I did in science. As I did, I learned, hey, this is a mistake. Well, guess what? I'm not making that mistake twice. That loss became a victory. Because I learned from my mistake, I adapted my programming, and I grew it in a way that allowed me to never make that mistake again. And, and over time, I took that to Michigan and to over 5,280 Olympic and pro athletes in 44 sports now. 
uh, they all have had the benefit of, of a dumb guy learning over the years. I, I really appreciate you sharing that, Coach. I mean, it really just sounds like when you're telling the story, you've got these great heuristics and these, and these principles, you know, that were, were passed on to you by, you know, grandfather, father, and then tested every day. And then you, you go out and you get this, this knowledge and this science but then is what we call in the military, how do you operationalize that? You know, we have this doctrine, you know, we lay, lay out principles, we have policies, but how that's, that's the leadership aspect of this based on, you mentioned the variables and come with multiple different approaches and you're really tailoring it for the, for the force that you have. So not everybody is a five-star recruit athlete, but how do you make, you know, a one or two-star recruit athlete, you know, end up giving you the, the, the amount of effort that you can bring together. And, and the thing that I loved about it, what you were telling is you were essentially talking about the journey. And I, and I heard you, you mentioned that, especially when you were talking the piece there with the Mueller's, you know, and, and I think that's, that's, it dovetails great in this, in this portion and next portion of this conversation is, you know, you really talk about success being the journey. And that's something, you know, I've heard uh, Mr. Ray Dalio talk about. It's not about moving to the next mountaintop. It's not about getting this next accomplishment. It's not about the number of wins. I mean, even the greats like Ben Hogan in golf will talk about, it's not about a, you know, a, a championship number. It's not about the number of championships. It's about how do you control your game? And I, I appreciate when I've heard you speak, it's not just the journey about going through the resiliency and the grit and the experiences and, and getting after this. It's, it's about who you meet along with you. You know, so it, 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 it reinforces this thing that I was listening to over the past weekend, this, this term. It's a South African term called Ubuntu. And it's, uh, you know, and, and I've heard, uh, you know, athletes have used this, you know, Coach Doc Rivers has mentioned, you know, I am because you are, you know, when this individual is, you know, raises his game, I raise my game. And so when, when I hear you talk about, you know, the lessons you've learned now going on this journey, the experience at Western Michigan, the op, uh, op, ability to operationalize this, I, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody that gets a chance to listen to this. If you're in charge of, you know, three to five as a team leader or, you know, not up to nine individuals as a squad leader, every one of those opportunities that you have is to continue along this journey, right? And, and you're going to have challenges, but how do you make them the best? And I think the most important portion in the end is it's, that, it's, the, it's the competition, it's the compete. How do you go through the preparation and the growth together along this journey and be ready to compete? And then those are going to, and they're going to know because everybody else will be, will be able to recognize it. Because in my mind, when you were explaining, hey, this is your potential, but this is the hard work, and you ask, what's the difference in that? For me, it's really, hey, if you can put the hard work in there, it's the next portion of it to even close the, close the gap even closer to that potential is you got to be able to compete. You know, I offer to my son, you can, I can get you in the arena, but I can't make you compete. And so, you know, I, I really hope everybody that's listening out there today will be able to say, you know, there are things that are going to be, and what I offer to the leaders, there are going to be times that the conditions are going to be miserable, and we expect them to be with your, with your soldiers. But if the conditions are dangerous, then I expect you to lead it. And a lot of times leading that is there's a chance that you can fall short. doesn't matter if you're a coach. doesn't matter if you're a leader. So I appreciate what you were sharing. And I think that, you know, what you're really telling this, telling this journey of West Virginia to Michigan now, it's, it's all these great athletes in the opportunity to optimize their best success, best teammate, make a teammate look great on the field, and then raise the overall performance level. But let's, let's transition and say – now it's no longer in a lot of the, the clients that you have. It's not about taking these professional athletes to reach and close that gap as you have the, the nothing of the only hard work and potential. And what is it like now just to get the success of having somebody being told and walks into your clinic and says, hey, they told me after three years I'd never be able to walk again. You know, it's, it's uh, one thing, I, you know, for me, I have, and I want to say this to the, to the people uh, in the service, I have the utmost respect for what you guys do, uh, more so than any human being on this planet. I, I, when I go to bed at night, I say goodnight to my kids, and I thank God for their safety. And you offer that. So for that, I am, I am always indebted to anything that is needed by the military service. Uh, the utmost respect for all of you. 
And that's uh, for me to go to bed and give, give my son and my daughter a kiss and know that they're safe is, is my greatest wish on this earth. And you provide that. And that will never be forgotten by anyone in our organization. So I, I'm appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part for me, when we transitioned, it was an interesting feat because I was in medicine. I wanted to help people. I was in sport because I love competition and aggression and, and, you know, the environment of explosiveness. And I love science. So I was able to take the two and marry them, take science and marry it to the environment that's most conducive for my lifestyle. And as you said, the journey is really all that matters in life. You know, I've got 29 championship rings and, you know, World Series rings and you name it. I've got just about everything you can fathom. I don't even know where they are. They're in a box somewhere. I don't, my kids play with them. They throw them around. I could care less about any of the, the objects that I receive the rings. And the, and the reality is it's kind of funny because it's really all in life. Everything you do, every breath you take, every moment you're alive is about the journey from the start to the finish. It's about what you pay, what you put in, the sacrifices you make, the people who walk next to you, your mother and father who sacrifice with your brother and sister, your friends, the relationships you develop, the hardships you face. That's what the journey is. And I ask people all the time at the beginning of seasons, you know, look, what do you want to win this year? And guys will raise their hand. You know, I want to win the Super Bowl. I want to win the Stanley Cup. Okay, great. I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy the trophy and I'm going to hand it to you. It's yours. You want it? And everybody looks in the room and they're quiet. I said, you want, you want the Lombardi trophy? You want the Stanley Cup? That's what I just heard. They look at me and they're like, oh, I don't want it. Why not? I didn't earn it. So you're telling me that the inanimate object, the ring, the trophy, whatever it might be, has no value to you. The reality is the only reason it has value is because it represents what you did to achieve it. It's the journey. It's those sacrifices, the hardship, the blood that you spilled and shed to fight for someone else, the sacrifices you made for the person that stands next to you, the suffrage you went through to get to the level that you achieved, the pain and hardship that your family had to face to get you to that place, the sleepless nights that your family face if you're in the military when you're away. Those are all suffering aspects that make the journey and the achievement worthwhile because there was hardship involved to get there. And the hearts of the individuals that sacrificed alongside you were invested in a cause that was greater than something basic like yourself. That journey and those tributaries make that trophy have value because sooner or later on the last day, you want to be able to look your maker in the eye and say, look, I ran as hard as I could run. I fought as long as I could fight. I pushed myself to the limits of what you gave me. And today I'm okay with death because today I can die your champion. And that mentality will convey to anything in life. And, and when I was training athletes for all those years, we had tremendous success. We we accomplished a lot of, of, of uh, goals that we set out to. We achieved a lot of rings and trophies and other aspects. Um, but there was always a missing piece that I felt like I wasn't all I should be. That although we were ranked top in the country, we were winning championships and all the other aspects, and I was there 17, 18 hours, there was still something that I wasn't getting done that I knew I could do. And that was some of the medical side, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not fulfilling all things. I'm, I'm using my, my knowledge of physiology and all the other aspects, my, my degrees in physiology to help develop athletes and help rehab people. But am I truly being as impactful as I can be every instant of every day? And uh, I was at West Virginia my last year there, 2007, we were ranked number one in the country going into our last game. Uh, against Pitt, who was terrible at that time, by the way. They had three wins. Uh, we, were, we were supposed to just trump them. And uh, as God would have it, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Uh, we had 400 and some odd yards to their 200. Pat McAfee was our kicker, uh, arguably one of the greatest ever to play. Uh, Multiple-time pro bowler, pretty funny guy on Barstool Sports. Uh, so, Pat, wonderful guy. And I still love him today. We still talk. Uh, he never missed field goals, ever. I mean, ever. 
and he missed two inside 50 yards, and he had never missed him in his career. Inside 30 yards just happened. Sometimes it just happens. You, nobody is humanly perfect. And Pat White dislocated his thumb. He was our quarterback. He was up for the Heisman, all-time leading rusher in the history of college football and only four-time bowl winner. Uh, Steve Slayton sprained his ankle. He was our running back. He was also a Heisman candidate. All happened the same day. We had 400-some-odd yards that are 200-some-odd yards, and we lost the game. How, I don't know. It just happened. Sometimes it's supposed to happen. And as a resulting factor, uh, we got knocked out of first place, and Oklahoma lost the same day. They were number two. So one and two lose and are out in fluke games. Uh, Michigan called, and we were offered the job at Michigan. I had turned down some other positions that year, actually 21. Uh, and decided that I was staying. And Michigan had called and, and offered the head coach the job, and, and he wanted to take it, came to talk to me, and I ended up going to Michigan. But I stayed for the game because uh, we ended up playing Oklahoma, one played two anyway, in the Fiesta Bowl. And while we were there, uh, it was funny. We ended up beating them, I want to say it's 47-14. We crushed them. So should have won a national championship. But everything happens for a reason in, in, in life, in my opinion. And uh, I end up going to Michigan. And when I walk through the doors after the game, we win the championship. We win the Fiesta Bowl. I land in West Virginia. I literally am there for 12 hours. I get on a plane, fly to Michigan. I start work the next morning. I don't like to sit around. I want to go to work. So I had people hauling stuff up, and I'm at work. Um, when I got there, I walked into the facility, and the first two people I met were Brandon Graham, the defensive end for the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, who was 315 pounds overweight and looked like a nose guard, not a D-end. And uh, he introduced himself. He shook my hand. He said, hey, coach, I'm Brandon Graham. And I said, hey, son, nice to meet you. What position you play? He said, defensive line. I said, oh, you're a nose guard. He said, no, nah, coach, I'm a DN. I said, not anymore. You're too fat. So he looked at me and started laughing. And I, we took Brandon Graham from 315 pounds to 270, uh, from a 4.940 to a 4.52, fastest time in college football in his weight. Uh, led the nation in tackles for a loss and sack and was, was a first-round draft pick, and he's changed his family's life. Uh, the other kid was a, a man named Elliot Mueller. He was a offensive tackle from Wauseon, Ohio, who was an Ohio State fan his entire life and uh, hated Michigan. Uh, in fact, uh, when he decided he was going to visit Michigan, he came down there, a very religious family, he came down to his dad, and he goes, I feel like God really wants me to go to see Michigan. And he said, son, that's not God. God hates Michigan. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, he thought, like, look, Dad, I know what you're telling me. I've had Ohio State, the big O on my wall my entire life. I really feel like I'm supposed to go visit. And he did. He took a visit, and, and on his visit, he committed to Michigan. Uh, which is crazy because the kid had been a fan his entire life. At the last minute, I decided to go to Michigan, which was crazy because I had already turned down over 20 jobs that year uh, with no intention of leaving. I just felt like I was supposed to because there was something missing, and I wanted to find that something. And my wife looked at me, and she said, look, you know, you, you've already accomplished what you've accomplished. You've had the opportunity to do what you want. Sooner or later, you got to do what you're asked to do. And I said, okay, then I'm going. So we went, and uh, upon arrival, he was in a sling. And he walked into the room, and I said, son, what happened? You tear your arm up playing football. Literally, I was there for minutes. And he looked at me, and he said, no, coach. He said, uh, we're in a bad car accident, and my brother's in the hospital, and I tore my arm up. And I stopped, and I thought, okay, I just came off a high. We just won a championship. And uh, this young man's in a sling. And I looked at him and I said, uh, okay, son, well, you know, what happened? And he stopped me and he said, hey, look, he said, my, my brother's in the hospital. And he said, we saw a motivational speech you did on ESPN. And um, we kind of look up, looks up to you. And, and is there any way you could go see him? And I said, sure, absolutely. You know, I'd be happy to do so. I skipped the meeting with the athletic director that day because Elliot Mueller told me a story. Uh, they were coming home from church on Christmas Eve. They stopped at a stop sign. Uh, proceeded through the stop sign, and a 90-year-old man ran the stop sign going 80 mile an hour. Uh, he killed his father. His father died that day. His uh, girlfriend died in his arms. 
his brother, uh, Brock, uh, was paralyzed from the waist down. And Elliot tore his shoulder out of the socket, ripping the door off the hinges to get his brother out of the car. And I remember thinking, wow, that game is really small. And uh, went to the hospital with him, and I saw Brock, and he had a smile on his face. He was tattered and torn. His arm was mangled. His back, his spine was tore apart. He couldn't move anything below his waist. Uh, and he was positive. He looked at me and he was smiling and I said, son, look, my background is in physiology, specialization in neuro. I know they told you you can't walk, but they don't know. No one does. It's an estimate based on what has been done before you, not on what you can do. 1%. That's it. 1% chance to walk based on an estimate of what was done before you. And the real truth is the only one that knows is what you're willing to work and what God is willing to will. And if you do the work and he wills it, it will happen. Anything is possible on this earth. And he looked at me and he smiled and nodded his head. When I left, I think Therbus told him I was nuts. He'll tell you that story, I'm sure. Therbus, he's crazy. You got to get used to being in the chair. That guy's nuts. There's no way. And, and uh, I end up a friend in Brock. You know, and, and we bring him to practice and we shoot him around a wheelchair. We throw ball, balls at him and tease him a bit. You know, he just fit in just like one of the guys. You know, he's, he was mm-hmm. a good friend. And uh, about two years went by and Brock still couldn't walk. He had gone through rehab and in a tremendous rehab facility at the University of Michigan. And, and they do an amazing job, but, he, but he, he didn't get his function back. And uh, as uh, insurance controls much of that variable, And they cut off the insurance, and so there was no longer rehabilitation afforded to him. And his mother called me and said, look, he's a wreck. You know, he feels like he's stuck, and he he has no way to progress. Would you mind talking to him? You know, his father's gone. And uh, and I did. So I I ended up sitting down talking to him, and I said, look, what do you you want to do? And he said, you know, I really don't have an option. I would keep working, but rehab is really not affordable at this point. I, I don't have insurance. And I said, well, do you want to walk or not? And he looked at me and he, he kind of got pissed. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I want to walk. Like, what do you think I've been doing for the last two years? You know, and I looked at him and I smiled and I said, then, then don't make any excuses. You know, you show up and you do the work. And he said, well, I don't have anybody to help me. And I said, we will. Our staff will. If, if we're afforded the ability to do so and we shirk our responsibility, then we deny what we were put on this earth to do. So if you show up, I'll show up. And he said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know yet. I'll figure it out. You show up, I'll show up. And he said, okay. So we started in the gym uh, and I, uh, Parker Whiteman was an assistant of mine. The two of us started working with him and, uh, and worked with him every day. And I sat down at night and wrote down things that I knew based on neurophysiology and, and how to approach it from a different way than had been done in the past because Approaching it from the same way really didn't afford us the opportunity to achieve anything. Uh, it, it wasn't working. We knew that 1% of the time that worked. So I had to come up with a new plan, formulate a new plan based on the things that I faced both environmentally and physiologically. So I sat down and formulated a new plan and, and we attacked it and we deviated and manipulated that fl- plan based on the results we achieved every day. Uh, we checked ourselves. If you don't check yourself, you don't get any better. Okay. This wasn't, uh, didn't uh, achieve to the level that we expected it to. Here's the metrics that we, we saw. We're going to reevaluate what we did. We're going to change that plan. And tomorrow we're going to have a different plan to establish a new direction to make sure that we're still heading in the same main direction, but we deviate as necessary to achieve the optimal results, uh, just like periodization. And, and uh, in doing so on the sixth week, we had a twitch. Uh, in, in, in six months, he stood and led us out of the tunnel in front of 110,000 people on his own two feet. And he touched the banner. And uh, to this day, it's still the loudest moment in in decibels in Michigan football stadium history uh, when he touched that banner. And he wanted me to walk to it with him. And I said, no, it's not my place. This is your moment. This is everybody moment, moment who's ever struggled in life. It's their moment and it's God's moment. I'm just the schmuck that got the help. So I'll stand here at the 50 and I'll help you get across the field when everyone's done. And I did. And, and when I got across the field, I had some water in my eye 
and the uh, and the and the players on the team looked at me and they were all crying because they had seen him in the weight room every day struggling alongside him. I knew there was no chance they were losing that game because they'd seen what he paid to win it. There's no way they were going to lose that game, and we should have got pounded because that we that that we weren't a very good football team that year, and. Uh, Connecticut was ranked top 10 in the country and we beat the living snot out of them because those guys saw what he went through to be there. They saw his journey and they were unwilling to accept defeat on a day when they saw what he went through to achieve it. It was his moment, his day. And uh, when I got the sideline, they said, coach, you got, you crying. I looked at him. I said, if Brock could walk straight, he wouldn't kick dirt in my face and we wouldn't have this problem. My eyes wouldn't be watered. And everybody started laughing. And Brock turned around and hit me with his damn crutch. And everybody laughed, and we went to work. But the reality was at that moment, as I saw them walk across the field, I realized that I wasn't doing what all I was supposed to do. And I knew what that was I was supposed to do. And for me, that was the defining moment of why I left uh, organized sport exclusively and opened what we did. And when we opened the, the training centers, we opened to everybody. We brought in people with disabilities. We brought in people from the general population. We brought in young kids that needed to learn different mentalities and, and have belief in themselves. And we laid them right next to the world's top athletes, and they all worked together. Uh, you know, I had Draymond Green in here last year and a young girl from uh, Miami who was a, a news reporter who was thrown from her car and paralyzed. And that day she was learning to crawl for her first time. And uh, she was crying and she was shook and he was running drills and midway through the drills, he leaned over to me and I saw his eyes water and he said, look, I said, you all right? No, I'm not all right at all. And he looked at me and I said, no, he's like, look at her, man. And I said, that's real life, son. That's real life. And he's like, wow, she's amazing. And he said, can I help her? And I said, there's nothing but air and space between you, buddy. That's right. So he went over and took a knee and uh, was actually rehabbing his, his hips at the time. And he crawled next to her for 45 minutes, every inch wow. of that workout. Watching one of the greatest NBA players in the world realize that we're all just people. There's nothing greater about one of us than another of us. The reality is the greatness isn't in the turf, it's not in the air, it's not found in the desk, it's not found in the, the metal, it's not found in anything outside of what's inside you greatness resides in one place and it's inside humanity and our job is to get it out and that reality of that minute of those two crawling and walking or working on walking together and her falling on his chest and tears in her eyes and him fighting showed him another level of where he could be and and now in our centers we have uh, people that come from Africa, China, India, Asia, Israel, you name it, they come from all over the world to rehab in one of the top neuro clinics in the world. And they're training in an intense environment right next to the world's greatest athletes, right next to the Draymond Greens, the Juice Landrys, the, you know, you name it, we have it. Stanley Cup winners, World Series winners, Super Bowl winners. They're all in there, thousands of these athletes. And the athletes look up to those guys more than those guys look up to the athletes. Because that same journey we talked about is no different. It's just a different adversary to overcome. And that reality is no matter what you face in life, no matter what degree of hardship, we're all people. And we all face some degree of hardship. The reality, reality is the adversary is different, but the approach must be consistent. Can we do what we need to do to design the periodization protocols to elicit the results we want from the cell? People always say it's sports specific. Training is cellular specific. You provide a given stimulus in a given environment to elicit a desired result. And that stimulus will accommodate an adaptation from your system to elicit a totally different ability to achieve the desired result. It is no different in trying to learn to walk or run in a 4 3 40. 
The difference is in the stimulus provided is more specific to the desired result you want to achieve. And then mentally, you have to focus on the same tangible aspects that that athlete did to achieve that result. And the journey has to have that same unwavering focus to accomplish what you desire. You know, it's funny. I always tell people, like, we're in a group of room. I say, hey, guys, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And they do it. They close their eyes. And I say, okay, when you open your eyes, I want you to tell me everything in the room that's green. And they open their eyes and they find everything green. Okay, close them again quick. And they close them. When they close them, I say, now tell me everything in the room is red. They can't name anything. And I said, why can't you name anything? Uh, you told me to find everything green or blue or whatever it was. And I smile and I look at them and I say, yeah, so you can't name anything except for what you were focused on. So when you learn to focus on what you want with an undivided attention, you will achieve it. If you try to focus on 75,000 things, you don't achieve it. The reality is find the task you're trying to achieve. Design the scientific protocol to elicit the cellular response you want, and then focus on that task with an unwavering intensity that allows you to achieve it. That's how we get there. That's how we get there. And now in these gyms, it's, it, it's awesome. I get to see little boys take their first step. I got to see a girl who was paralyzed for 11 years. At 11 years old, she got paralyzed. At 22, she took her first step. Wow. Wow. Nothing in the world more rewarding than seeing people accomplish their dreams. And that really just comes from me helping get the greatness that God put in them out. I didn't put it there. That's, that's an awesome, that's an awesome story. And, and I appreciate you sharing that coach, because I remember one of those things that you'd mentioned, I, I saw it online. You talked about the catalyst in your life. And when you tell that story about the Mueller brothers, you know, and Brock specifically, you know, and then you, you brought him on stage. I mean, if you're watching that and you have any humanity inside you, you know, you're, you're exactly right. We're all going to have dirt in our eye, you know, we're all going to have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of water for some reason. But uh, I, I thought that was incredible, you know, when you go from, and, and there's a lot of lessons I think that our team can learn from, because if they were listening to how you were talking about the journey, you know, just going through a trying to figure out all these different techniques and approach and something may not work and going back and again and not being frustrated, both as the as the coach, the leader, you know, and the trainer, as well as those, you know, the uh, the athlete or the individual going through the rehab. So, you know, we're, we're going through a new process here in, in the Army. We're doing this Army Holistic Health and Fitness, and it really talks about all the things you're, you're mentioning. There's the physical aspect with strength coaches, you know, athletic trainers, physical therapists, mental, you know, piece where we've got a mental performance coach, sleep, uh, nutrition. So all those things that you already incorporate. And then we're really using this new Army combined uh, combat physical readiness test, getting after this portion of it. And a lot of times, you know, if they looked at the stats, you would see all these soldiers that were non-deployable, had injuries beforehand, those that uh, have to rely on uh, some type of sleep medication to get after. If I'm a brand new leader coming in, and I wasn't necessarily an athlete in high school, but I'm now in, you know, what I consider you're, you're now having to be a professional athlete with guns, and I become a leader, you know, one, as a soldier, what should I do? you know, to start off on this journey, you know, and just in, as you talk about physiologically, psychologically, as we've talked about mindset, and then just to get my body right, you know, physically. And then the second portion, now, as I become a, a sergeant, and I become a team leader, and I am responsible for three to five individuals, and everything you're talking about in this journey, and all these different clients that you have, I know that there's multiple approaches, and you're constantly going back and assess and tweaking it to get them to move toward whatever their goal. What advice would you give both to the soldier and to the leader that are now may not necessarily have the science and the background that you had going into this? You know, it's funny. I mean, it's, it's a great question. I think sometimes when we look at things we're trying to accomplish or we look at tasks uh, that we want to achieve or goals that we set out to achieve, um, oftentimes we focus so much on the outcome 
that we forget about the process that gets us there. And, 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 and with that, that's what makes up the journey. And, and, and with that, looking at not just the steps to achieve it, but looking at myself and what I need to refine to make me the most efficient to achieve it. And, and, and some of that might be, you know, maybe I'm not in the fitness that I want to be in. Maybe I'm not in uh, uh, to a level of strength that I wanted to achieve. Maybe I'm not, uh, I haven't studied the aspects of, of, of the different physiological traits that I need to achieve the goal. Those are different aspects. I think there always comes down to having a mental aspect in every task you have. What are the mental tangible aspects? What is the cognitive uh, circumstance that you must face? Is it, is, if it's a mathematic problem, am I capable of solving these problems? Have I done the studies necessary to achieve and understand the process I need to go through, uh, both you know, mentally and physically? The next aspect was, am I prepared physically to achieve the task? Do I do what's necessary for myself to recover and be replenished to perform it again tomorrow? Uh, am I, am I complete, continuously refreshing my mind? Am I giving myself a cardiovascular outlet to allow the stress retrieval? Am I removing myself from the circumstances to allow my mind to recover? Am I getting the internal focus aspects that are necessary to sit and dwell on what I'm trying to accomplish? Because a lot of times we get into the problem and we're so into the problem that we're not thinking about ways to manipulate and move around. You have to daily attack the problem, then remove yourself from it, refresh your brain, do something else that separates you, and then come back to it with a fresh mind and attack it again. Because now immediately, it's funny, I do that, I usually go home, I work out, then I get in the shower. When I get in the shower, I find most of the answers. Because my brain is relieved, and then I start thinking about the process. Okay, what did I do today? Where did I fail? Where did I succeed? Where I succeeded, I want to attack more aggressively. Where I failed, I need to manipulate and adapt. Now I can say, why did I fail? Where I failed is the first step. Why I failed is the second step. Third step is how do I change how I failed? And then how do I integrate it back into the program? Four basic steps, right? Where I failed, why I failed, how do I change what I have failed? And now how do I integrate it back into the program? That is the same as an individual as it is to, with a leader. The difference comes in integration. Mm -hmm. Now you're evaluating how to integrate it into multiple people's programs. You're also evaluating where everyone might have failed differently. Maybe three succeed and the fourth one failed. Why did they fail? Was it a trait that they have? that we need to work on and help them modify to help them succeed? Or was it a failure in the plan? If it was a failure in the plan, then a plan needs to adapt. If it was a failure in the trait, then I need to invest in time in that individual to help them rise to another level so they can achieve the task. All of those things come back to me being willing to be honest with myself. Oftentimes when we're tough and we're hardworking and we're disciplined, we don't like to admit to ourselves failure. But if we can't admit it, we can't change it. And the reality is sitting down in private and saying, I failed at this task. Here's why I failed. Or my team failed at this task. Here's why they failed. Or a part of my team failed at this task. Here why, here's why they failed. Every one of those failures innately is my responsibility. It is no longer their responsibility because I'm in charge. Therefore, their failure is my failure. So inherently, I need to look at their failure and understand what it was so I can modify and adapt what was necessary to help them achieve. And the sacrifice of myself will come at a greater cost to me than it should to them. Because I should give more of what I have than they do of what they have to make sure they achieve the task. And in doing so, they are more willing to suffer to achieve the task. That, for me, is how I evaluate everything that happens. I have a plan. I have a procedure to achieve the plan that I design. I then have a desired outcome for the plan. Every day that plan is modified and adapted. 
to, to, to accomplish the goal or allow the individual within that organization to achieve it more readily, but it doesn't deviate from the end result or overall tangible aspect that I set forth to achieve. I'm just modifying it based on what I learned succeed, is successful and what I learned is not successful. And I'm not repeating failures that I've had. I'm allowing those failures to modify the plan so that the plan overall does not fail in the end result. And from my standpoint, the evaluated process is key in having that happen. And being honest with oneself in your failures is the only way you ever achieve a really, really smooth transition to an accomplishment. I think that's great advice, Coach. I mean, you're talking about increased self-awareness and then stepping back from the process, reflecting, and then continuing to go back and then accentuating on the things that you've done well and then coming up again. But it, it almost goes back to the, the building that mindset. It goes back to the, the lesson you're teaching your, your daughter about fear. Because those that don't want to go back and, as you mentioned, get focused solely on the task, it really goes back to this mindset. You've got to be able to deal with the fear. You know, and that really, for a lot of our team, it's the fear of failure. You know, and it's a failure of failure. The, you know, the, you, you, you continue to increase in, in increased responsibility and authority. You don't want to fail and let your team down. And there's nothing worse, and it doesn't worse than, a, you know, when, as a leader to know that you were the one that made a decision or you made a call, especially in, in this business as we prepare right up on the, the crucible of ground combat. And you knew you made a decision that led to, you know, someone having to give the ultimate sacrifice. So this is what, what, what I need the team to, to listen as we're having this great conversation is these are when you need to make these failures. These are when you need to go work multiple approaches. So when you do get into those situations, as we talk about ground combat and duress, time sensitive, you will be more comfortable knowing what you need to do. And then that mindset is the last that you have to worry about as you're working through that. Yep, I agree. And it's, it, I say it's that state dependent learning that you see in psychology. You know, people say all the time, state dependent learning. If you learn in a state, that is so aggressive, so intense, and so difficult that when you show up for whatever you're competing in, it feels comfortable, you're going to be just fine. I, I wanted, because you shared about your, your daughter, a lot of times with the team, I share about my son, my 16-year-old son, which if he ends up joining the military, they'll have no more, no more stories about him, you know, before he even, you know, gets in there, the poor kid. I love it. But I wanted to show you, so this past weekend, I walked into his room. And, you know, every time I do that, I'm a little, con you know, concerned about what I'm going to find. And I walked in there and I saw all these, like, little sticky notes around. And one of them, as you were talking about, you know, the fear, one of those notes that he has, he writes, stop fearing the possibility of no. Ego is self-improvement. Ego is meant to be humbled. And he's kind of going through, he's written some of these things down, and I'm like, I, I, I told my wife I needed to check to see if he was adopted because I don't know where he got any of that stuff from. So You know what? He's going to be just fine in life because the reality is when you can, can self-evaluate and you can talk to yourself in a manner that allows you to be positive and achieve, you will. What you, you know, people always say what you believe you achieve, right? It's a reality. Yep. It's, it's the ability to talk yourself into – letting everything inside you out and not being afraid to be all you were meant to be is really what lets you succeed. Absolutely. Because greatness sits inside every one of us. And, and when you get it out, people see it and they're like, wow, it was just an amazing moment. It wasn't the moment. It was the person. The reality is that person found what was in them and they had no inhibition. They let it go. They weren't afraid of what people thought. They weren't afraid of whether or not they, they were unsuccessful. They weren't afraid of any of that. They were willing to have that failure so that when it time came and it was absolutely crucial, they had already exposed themselves and they had already solved the problems that they had so that the, the, the moment no longer had risk from internal failure. And that to me, it's, Something is worth its weight in gold and more. Well, hey, Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time and sitting down and having this conversation. You've laid out some incredible gems. 
I appreciate you sharing your story and talking about some key principles that have talked about really the importance of the journey and those that you have gone on this journey with and to have them share uh, particularly about the, the Mueller brothers. And we're hoping to, to get uh, them to actually tell their story at some point, and hopefully you'll be there with them and we can make this kind of a part two portion of it. I think that it would absolutely send an incredible story about resiliency and, you know, really – achieving some goals and about really becoming the one percent i mean and it's incredible and i know they've shown some key things on highlights in espn and it's a truly touching story for those that are looking for some inspiration and just you know you watch that you can't you cannot not you cannot be part of a team like you mentioned you know at michigan and not go out there and defy the odds and and want to compete and, and end up winning and we always leave those that are listening, and we, we ask them, uh, what are your questions? But I want to leave the final word with you. You know, uh, for me, I, I think, uh, first of all, I'm honored to have been here, and, and I'm extremely grateful for what you guys have done and do every day. And uh, I think that I know that our country is better served when they realize the sacrifice you have made, and, and uh, I am very, very thankful for that. And I appreciate everything you've done, and, and I appreciate you even having me. It's a true honor to even be on. Uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I left one thing, I would say that anything that you attack in life, if you first look inside, you have the ability to achieve it. And it's when we look at a task and we try to look at the size of it and we look at the enormity of – the situation that we feel small, but the reality is anything that's accomplished is happened because of human beings doing it. And for that to happen, it means that somewhere inside it had to come out to make it happen. So no matter the size of the task, no matter the enormity of the struggle, Everything you need lies within you to accomplish it. The question is, when you look at yourself, do you allow yourself to know that you will achieve it every time? If you do, you rid yourself of fear and it's no longer in the way. Because fear is trying to stand between everything you want in life and everything you want to accomplish. When you push it out of the way and you look inside and say, what's in me is what lets me accomplish this task. And you know that you own it and you control it. It gives you the certainty to know that you will achieve what you set out to do. And for me, when men and women know that, they're a dangerous adversary. Well, I appreciate it, Coach. It's a great conversation. My honor. God bless you all, man, and good luck. And thank you again, guys. I'm, I'm very grateful for all you do. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Experience. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the newest podcast. The Leadership Experience will showcase professionals within five different subseries. Number one, Masters of our craft, the essence of warfighting. Number two, students of our profession, as we understand organizational culture and concepts of leadership. Number three, professional athletes with guns, as we talk hardships and maintaining a competitive advantage. Number four, grit and resiliency, the ability to overcome and perform under pressure. And number five, safe and secure environment, as we talk soldier well-being and building trust within our organization and the profession as whole. Well.